Hello, and thank you to Ben for that introduction, and um, thank you to everyone who's helped organise tonight, because it's really um, a special experience for me to um, come out into the country and talk about one of the things I love most, which is space archaeology. And I'm going to explain to you a little bit more about what that is and how it relates to the film that we're about to see very shortly. So just some definitions, first of all. People usually think archaeology is something to do with old things, and a lot of the time it is. But strictly speaking, what archaeologists do is look at material culture. They look at stuff and how it interacts with the lives of humans. So that means really it, can, it doesn't, isn't restricted to a particular time period. You can do archaeology on anything. You can do archaeology on 10 minutes ago. You can do an archaeological study of this theatre after we leave it. It's really about the material stuff. So what I'm interested in is all of that stuff that's related to space exploration. So this is very contemporary and very recent. It's within the, the living memory of, of most of us. Um, and if I had to put um, uh, an earliest date on it, I'd say it starts from around about 1936, when that rocket that you see down there was first developed, the V2 rocket, which is the originator of all of the rockets that we've so the space age, as I call it, goes from about 1936 until the present, and I'm interested in all of the stuff that belongs to that, and that means I'm looking at everything on the surface of the Earth, to all human material that is spread throughout the solar system. So what we're going to do very quickly tonight is go on a very brief tour of the solar system and have a look at some of the places and the objects that I study as an archaeologist and which I think have a, a tremendous significance for human history and for how people feel and interact with space. So we're going to start off looking at a space site on Earth, one in Australia. Then we're going to shoot up into low Earth orbit, jet across to the moon, which of course relates very much to our film tonight. Then we'll loop around, make a quick stop on Venus, and then curl back out right out to the edge of the solar system. So, <coughs> five very quick stops where I'll give you a little snapshot of some of the, the, the human material that is out there in space, that is our archaeological record in space. Now, many of you would know a fair bit about this site. This is the Woomera launch site. It's one of the earliest rocket launch sites in the world. Established in 1947, right at the end of the Second World War, and the V2 rocket that we saw on the first side was the basis for developing a whole range of rockets and missiles that were designed for warfare and also to go into space. So for a period from around, from the end of the Second World War up until the mid-70s, Woomera, the rocket launch site out in the deserts of South Australia, was at the forefront of international, global space exploration. And I find it astonishing that, that this has kind of been forgotten for them. What we see in these pictures, uh, the top picture shows you um, a launch site on the edge of a vast salt lake. This is a European rocket that was ultimately unsuccessful in launching a satellite. But Australia was once a member of the organisation that um, was the precursor of the European Space Agency. We were once playing with the big boys, if you like, uh, of all the European nations in space. Um, in the middle, you can see that map of Australia, the red areas there, are uh, the Woomera prohibited area. So um, in, up until about um, 1980, um, let's say, it was both of those red areas there were part of the rocket range. Now it's just the bit in the middle of South Australia. But that red area there, it's 127,000 square kilometres. You can fit all of England inside that red area. It's huge. It's one of our biggest assets. In the 1960s, Woomera was the second busiest <coughs> launch site in the world after Cape Canaveral. Busier than anything in Russia, busier than everything in Europe, busier than anything else. This is a major space site. And it's in Australia, and it's kind of a bit forgotten these days, apart from the detention centre. What's also forgotten is that picture you can dimly see, black and white one on the far right. That's the Resat 1 satellite launched in 1967. The launch of this satellite made Australia the fourth nation in the world to go into space. Yes, that's right, the fourth nation. And we've kind of, you 
know, we don't make a big deal about this anymore. This is really significant stuff. So when you look at the site of Woomera, it's played an incredibly important role in the development of Australian technology and of international space technology. And it's something that I think we need to do more about. We need to celebrate this place a bit more. It's the most important place. So that's our little site on the surface of the Earth. Let's move up into Earth orbit now. You can probably just faintly make out on the left-hand side of the picture um, a little circle, which is the Earth. Can people see that? And you can probably just see a whole little, little white dots all around it. If it was a bit darker in here, what you'd see is the Earth in the middle surrounded by space junk. You see the white ring around the Earth? That's the low Earth orbit region. That big sort of wide circle is the geostationary orbit. That's where all of the telecommunications satellites are. Now let's move on to the Moon, our third stop in this little tour of the solar system. And of course, we're going to be hearing a lot more about the Moon as we watch this film coming up. What this picture shows is the location of all of the Apollo landing sites. So the little blue writing you can see uh, is where all of the Apollo missions from 11 through to 17, with the exception of 13, and I'm sure most of you remember why that is, and if you've forgotten, the film is really white. So what I'm going to talk a little bit more about is the Apollo 11 landing site, which you can see uh, on the right hand, the lowest right hand blue writing, that's on, on the edge of the scene of tranquility. So remember, these are just the Apollo landing sites. There are also a number of un, un peopled missions, hard and soft landing spacecraft, American ones all over the place on the moon, whole, so a whole bunch of Russian ones, and I think there's a big Indian one there too. So, Tranquility Base. This is, as, for an archaeologist, this is such an interesting site. This is the first place where human beings <coughs> set foot on another planet, on another world, on another celestial body. So there's a whole lot of historical and social and political reasons why this place is pretty important and pretty special. But for me, it's also an archaeological site. So the pictures I've got up here, on the left-hand side, that line drawing is exactly how we would map an archaeological site. It includes the location of um, bits of material, so, so in the centre you can see the lunar, lunar landing module. It includes places where samples were taken, pits and burrows. It includes the location of things like the lunar um, laser ranging um, station. It's like a map of the site. It's a, a, it shows the location of where everything is, all the material is, and it also shows the topographic features. So what's interesting about this place is that legally, all of the material there is owned by the United States. Under the terms of the Outer Space Treaty, it owns all of the material there. But an archaeological site isn't just the material, it's also the traces. So the archaeological site of Tranquility Base, where the Apollo 11 astronauts landed, is all of the footprints and the tracks and the, the marks and the holes in the furrows where they took samples and where they carried out different activities. However, um, these the site as a whole is not protected in any way under any sort of international agreement or treaty or, or convention or anything. So the material might be safe. As long as the US wants to say, um, we're keeping this, we own it, you can't touch it, that's fine. But anyone can walk, well not anyone, any future traveler to the moon and there are going to be some things, can walk onto that site and destroy the traces that show what humans did when they first stepped on another planet. There's nothing to stop them. There's no convention or agreement or anything to stop people doing that. So let's move on from Tranquility Base now to Venus. Venus is interesting. If the moon is sort of a bit equal US-USSR in terms of the material that's on it, Venus is almost entirely dominated by the USSR. So there have been two US um, missions to Venus that have landed on the surface and there have been 16 um, Russian ones. The one that is my favourite is the Venera 14 mission. The picture at the top shows you what the Venera 14 um, lander looked like after it separated from, from the spacecraft that took it there and after it had come through the atmosphere and settled down. So it's still quite likely when you look at the um, environment and atmosphere and conditions on Venus 
it's quite likely that this still actually survives, sitting out there all by itself. Um, not quite all by itself, so the map on the right shows you the location of some of the other landing sites on there, and they're mostly Russian ones. But this planet has a whole number of archaeological sites, very interesting places, and I used to say, um, or think that they're all pretty safe, no one's going back to Venus anytime soon. But, as some of you may have heard, the European um, Space Agency and um, a few other interested players are actually planning on going back to Venus. So from my perspective as an archaeologist, I'm interested in how they might interact with these places, what they might do with these sites. Now, a final stopping point in this space archaeology tour. Right on the edge of the solar system, there are two spacecraft we've lost contact with, Pioneers 9 and 10. And there are two, we're still in contact with Voyagers 1 and 2. For some reason, Voyager 2 is my favourite. The picture down the bottom um, shows you what, on the bottom right, shows you what it looks like when at the very edge of the solar system. What happens when all of the solar wind and the influences from the sun actually come slap bang up against the interstellar medium, all of the other things that are happening out in the rest of the galaxy. And the Voyagers have passed that point, we're now going out. Um, and just, I think, might have been late last year or earlier this year, um, some data came in from Voyager 2, which showed that those sort of boundaries between what's happening in our solar system and what's happening in the rest of the galaxy are a lot more complex and a lot more complicated and bubbly and mixed up than anyone thought they would be. So they're still returning really useful um, data. They're the furthest out things that, that exist in terms of looking where, where the influence, the impact of human culture, of human technology can be seen. This is our outer limit, these two little space companies. So at the moment, this is the outer limit of archaeology, of human material culture, of our capacity to go and explore space. And that's the end of our tour of the solar system. There are so many other places and spacecraft that I would have loved to talk about, but that can be for another time.